Well, hello, everybody, um, and welcome. Uh, thank you for joining today's virtual briefing on the U.S. Department of Agriculture's Agriculture Research Service, or ARS. Um, ARS is an agency that employs more than 7,000 federal employees and performs food and agricultural research across the country and around the world. This is part two of a three-part series on USDA's research agencies uh, put together by the National Coalition of Food and Agricultural Research, or NCFAR. Our next briefing on the final two research agencies at USDA, uh, the Economic Research Service, or ERS, and the National Agricultural Statistics Service, or NAS, will be held on Tuesday, April 6th at 1 p.m. Eastern, so mark your calendars now. So um, a recording of this briefing and a recording of our last briefing on the, uh, on the NIFA, the National Institute of Food and Agriculture, will be available on NCFAR's website. And I can actually put the link into the chat too. Uh, so today we have three excellent speakers for you. Dr. Russ Jessup is an associate professor in the Department of Soil and Crop Sciences at Texas A&M University. And he works with the scientists at the co-located ARS facility in College Station, Texas. Dr. Alice Lichtenstein is the lead scientist on the cardiovascular nutrition team at the John Mayer USDA Human Nutrition Research Center on Aging, which is an ARS facility located at Tufts University in Massachusetts. But first, I'm very happy to introduce the ARS administrator, Dr. Shavonda Jacobs-Young. Dr. Jacobs-Young has graciously offered to share an introduction to her agency, uh, after which she will take a few questions before she has to sign off. So please go ahead and submit your questions for Dr. Jacobs-Young, and then I will ask them after she's finished. So with that, uh, here's Dr. Jacobs-Young. Take it away. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Elizabeth. Uh, we missed you at USDA, and so thank you so much. Um, good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining us today. I am going to uh, turn my camera off just to help with broadband um, so that we can experience the presentation with hopefully without any interruptions. Um, I am Shavonda jacobs Shung, Administrator of the Agriculture Research Service, and I'm happy to be here today. And I will turn my camera back on um, when we are ready for questions and answers. So thank you. So good afternoon again. I'm Shabanda jacobs Young, Administrator of the Agricultural Research Service, and currently serving as Acting Undersecretary for Research, Education, and Economics, and Acting Chief Scientist for USDA. I'm delighted to be here for the second of NCFAR's three webinar series on USDA research investments. NCFAR is to be commended for organizing this webinar series. It is an important resource for educating new members of Congress and congressional staff about our vital work. My thanks to NCFAR for the kind invitation to offer remarks. Today, I will highlight the Agriculture Research Service, or ARS, one of the four agencies, along with the Office of the Chief Scientist, housed within the REE mission area of USDA. I'm happy to be joined on this webinar by two scientist colleagues who work closely with ARS, Dr. Alice Lichtenstein at the John Mayer USDA Human Nutrition Research Center on Aging, and Dr. Russell Jessup, Associate Professor in the Department of Soil and Crop Sciences at Texas A&M University. On the call today, we are also joined by Mr. Gary Mayo, ARS Legislative Director. I just wanted to quickly share this slide that is um, the priorities of our new administration. And we're very happy to welcome Secretary Vilsack back to the Department of Agriculture. I just want to share that ARS will be a, a key member and a critical play a critical role for each one of these priorities. And we look forward to working with our new colleagues across the department. ARS is an intramural research agency and has pioneered innovative solutions to agricultural challenges that impact the quality of life for all Americans. Every day, ARS scientists collaborate with farmers and producers to deliver healthy, safe agriculture products to consumers in the U.S. and around the world. Our research focuses on how to grow and raise more safe crops and animals, how to keep crops and animals free of diseases and pests, and how to bring farmers the tools they need, new crop varieties, farming methods, and computer models that help them decide when is it best to plant or to harvest, and how to optimize inputs like fertilizers. 
and how to develop water and soil management strategies for robust, sustainable production to assist in being great stewards of the environment. Science drives all of this. Our scientists, engineers, soil scientists, hydrologists, plant pathologists, economists, veterinarians, and experts from other scientific disciplines are all well-educated, passionate public servants with a keen interest in innovation and a vision of what is possible. So let me run through a quick ARS by the numbers to give our viewers a sense of the scale of ARS operations here in the US and globally. ARS employs roughly 6,000 employees, 15,000 of which are PhD scientists with expertise in a wide range of disciplines. Currently about 220 postdocs work for ARS or at our ARS facilities, plus an additional 74 hired through other mechanisms. A strong, vibrant postdoc network is vital to our work as it enriches the depth, continuity, and impact of our research. This network is also uh, well positioned to advocate for ARS and agricultural sciences as they continue their careers. I should also add that we have some extraordinary scientists in ARS who've been here since they were postdocs, including scientists of the year winners and ARS Hall of Fame scientists. So we're very excited about our work with our postdocs. Next, I'd like to share with you information about ARS buildings and facilities. ARS-owned real property assets include 15,436,546 square feet and 3,051 buildings and 1,834 structures on 403,307 acres of owned and leased land at 94 domestic locations one foreign location and 86 domestic work sites. The average age of our laboratories is 47 years old. 46% of our overall portfolio are over 50 years old and 27% of our portfolio is over 60 plus years old. The total value of the property asset portfolio is roughly $5 billion. This does not include MBAF. For comparison, in terms of life cycle, the industry standard is around 25 to 30 years before complete renovation or modernization is required, depending on how well a building has been maintained. The deferred maintenance calculation of ARS facilities for FY 2021 is at $606 million compared to $585 million in FY 2020. ARS's FY21 budget is about $1.5 billion, which includes 20, about $20 million for repair and maintenance as a direct line item in the appropriation. We spend about $40 million in program dollars for a 4% overhead for repair and maintenance, and eight to $20 million on deferred maintenance funded by salary labs and year-end funding when it is available. Um, and since 2015, we've received $1,107,000,000 in our buildings and facility account for executing projects as outlined in our capital investment strategy. At present, ARS has 660 projects that are uh, conducted across the country and in our four overseas laboratories. With, that are coordinated by our 15 national programs across nutrition, food safety and quality, animal production and protection, crop production and protection, and natural resources and sustainable agricultural systems. From a return on investment standpoint, the Economic Research Service has determined that each dollar invested in agricultural research results in $17 of economic impact. So those are the numbers, but what's behind the numbers? What does all of this translate into? What story do these numbers tell us? Today's complex challenges require cutting edge solutions that are collaborative and draw on the insights of many scientific disciplines. ARS research is rigorous and big picture. We understand the importance of constantly refining agricultural and natural resource practices, management and tools to match current and future production conditions. 
allow me to quickly highlight a sampling of particularly promising signature research projects that were undertaken during this difficult past year. For example, ARS played a key role in conducting SARS-CoV-2 um, work in terms of looking at the impact to agriculturally important animals. ARS conducted research on cattle, pigs, and deer and common poultry to determine whether there was a transmissibility um, issues and whether there was an issue of being able to then um, infect others with the disease. We found that common poultry, cattle and pigs did not pose a, a threat to um, agriculture producers um, because they were not susceptible to the virus. However, we are continue, continuing to conduct work on the white-tailed deer, and we hope to have more of that information available soon. We also worked with Kansas State University and determined that mosquitoes and biting midgets um, did not pose a threat for infection of SARS-CoV-2. We conducted research on cover cropping and looking at some of the innovative ways to help prevent um, the reducing excess nitrogen and preventing its escape from farmlands. And so that was important work that was conducted during, during our um, pandemic stat stature in, in which our agency was in maximized tele telework status, but finding a way to be safe and, and really address some of our mission related goals. Excitingly, ARS identified a commercially available cell line that can be used to rapidly isolate and detect African swine fever virus. And this is critically important as we continue to push the envelope of innovation and develop vaccines that are critically important for foreign animal disease. And in this case, it really does help us respond to African swine fever that is not in the United States at this time. However, it will be important for us to protect U.S. agriculture. And, and during the pandemic, we were able to provide some support to our partners in the Food, food Safety and Inspection Service to help meet their regulatory requirements. And one example that I'm sure many on the call today um, are, are familiar with is the Asian giant hornet. And as a part of our Ag 100 Pest Initiative, we work to assemble genomes for the top 100 arthropod pests in this country. And in our work with the Asian giant hornet, the breakthrough helped to counter the hornet's establishment in the United States. Another program that we have underway in ARS is our Breeding Insights Program. In collaboration with Cornell University, ARS established Breeding Insights to develop and support open source breeding tools for genomic selection and specialty crops and animals. The purpose of the Breeding Insights is to transform breeding by enabling the implementation of genomic insight and selection as a part of a routine breeding program across all of ARS basically working to shorten the time between discovery and dissemination of our agricultural products. We also created the Innovation Program, Innovation Fund Program. This is a slide that doesn't want to quite show here. The Innovation Fund in ARS helps us to do exactly what our mission is, and that's to deliver scientific solution. The Innovation Program is not a large program, but it's a program that's had tremendous impact on our ability to accelerate the adoption of our research. And so this program, while small in stature, is award-winning and has won the Federal Laboratory Consortium's Innovative Tech Transfer Program of the year in 2020. So we're very excited about the innovation program. I also wanna share with you that to support high-tech innovative research, we need a high-tech IT um, infrastructure. And we've developed a high-performance computing network across the country. One of our newest partners is at Mississippi State University with the addition of Atlas to Cynet. And so we're very excited about this high performance computing capacity and the ability to really be um, leaders in the agents, leaders in the area of um, IT for agriculture research. We've also um, established an, a center for artificial intelligence, which we are very excited about. Of course, ARS scientists have been using artificial intelligence and we are working to formalize and take 
our, our interest and our efforts in this area to the next level. Um, it's just really also worth sharing that um, artificial intelligence is not only important for scientific program, we found a way to be more efficient in our administrative and financial um, processes by integrating artificial intelligence. And we can't wait to share more with you about um, our efforts around artificial intelligence. So as you know, ARS and everyone at ARS plays an essential role in delivering our mission. And I like to say um, that you don't have to be the farmer to help a farmer. Regardless of what our employees' roles may be, purchasing supplies, arranging travel, maintaining facilities, feeding animals, measuring scientific results, and so many others, everyone's contributions make a difference to our agency. Indeed, what could be more impactful than helping to feed the planet? What could be more inspiring than helping to feed the future? So with that, I'd like to um, stop here and thank you for your time and attention. Well, this is uh, Elizabeth again. Uh, thank you so much for that terrific presentation, Shavanda. Um, we have just, do we have time for a few questions? If that's okay with you? Yes, um, I'm sorry. Okay, great. I can't see you, Elizabeth. Have I stopped yeah, sharing the camera? Here we go. Here yeah. I am. Okay. So if we have time for just a few questions, absolutely. Uh, I'll just ask you three. We got three that came in. Um, okay. So the first one is, what are the Agricultural Research Services plans for providing place-based research assistance in states without ARS research facilities, uh, specifically in states like Alaska, where issues related to soils, pests, seeds, crops, and the changing climate are different from the conditions in the lower 48. And actually it was another related question was, why did that map that you shared at the beginning not include Alaska and Hawaii? Well, you know, I can take a look at that. I know that we've had some investments in, the, the map I showed was um, specifically for a BNF um, facility investments. Uh, we have had some investments in he our location in Hilo, Hawaii, so I'm not sure. I have to make sure it has not fallen off the map. I will <laughs> take a look at that. Um, it's it's my fault because I cut and pasted it from another presentation from somebody else. So <laughs> because it really showed where we were, those green dots showed where we're making new investments. Um, so we do have a location in Hilo, Hawaii. Um, it's named after Senator Inouye, and uh, we do some very, very important work there. So um, I will make sure that I uh, take a look at that slide. And, you know, I, the, the, the laboratories and locations in Alaska precede me in ARS. And I know that the secretary um, and, 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 and others have been discussing about, uh, discussing Alaska, the location there. And so we're looking at ARS and I know that we have conducted research that can address some of the issues that are um, uh, located in um, Alaska. And I look forward to working with our colleagues to determine, so what more can we do to support Alaska? I know uh, from a climate hub perspective, if there's opportunities to look look at, you know, do we need a location in Alaska? What would we do to, you know, create a location in Alaska? And so we're definitely ready and open to listening. And in my position as acting um, undersecretary for RE, certainly willing to to work cooperatively to determine what more can we do to be supportive. Great. All right. So the, the, the second question was from someone who said she was sorry she was a little late to the webinar and asked whether you when you were mentioning equipment, were you just talking about ARS labs? Or is it possible that researchers at her university, South Dakota State, uh, might be able to apply for equipment funding through the same mechanism? So I'm not sure I talked about equipment. Maybe that was in a NIFA presentation with Carrie Castile. Um, I talked about uh, buildings and facilities. Um, and so uh, ARS is an intramural program, and so all of our the majority of our funding is invested internal to ARS. So all of our scientists and our employees are federal employees. Our sister agency, the National Institute of Food and Agriculture, is an extramural agency, which means that the majority of their funding is, is um, disseminated outside of the agency. And so ARS um, works cooperatively with the land grant university system across the nation. In fact, a third of our labs are located on land grant university campuses. And I'm very excited to say that in our building and facility efforts around our capital investment strategy, that we have seven new projects that are, that are being developed 
on land grant university campus is where we're co-located and so when we have an opportunity i just i want to be able to not only support ars scientists but also support our partners as we move together and so very excited about our projects that are um, happening at our co-located locations i um, mean i will follow up with um national institute of food and agriculture really to um so elizabeth we can follow up on more information about their equipment grants Yes, they do have an equipment grant program. And okay, last question. Um, as COVID continues to mutate, will ARS continue to assess possible infectivity in animals? And so, you, you know, that's a great question. We had a number of key questions that we identified around COVID in agriculture. And one of the, the good, so let me just back up. When, when, when the pandemic first occurred, we took a look across all of our coronavirus research. Like, do we have anything, you know, what are we doing in coronavirus? And we recognized that it wasn't a whole lot, but we had some. Fortunately, what we had in the intramural agency is a portfolio of experts who could redirect their attention to the coronavirus. And so internal to ARS, we made the decision, I made the decision to redirect some of our efforts to be on the coronavirus work. And so in, in, in Ames, Iowa is where we've done some of our, done our cattle and swine and white, tier, white deer, white tail deer work, say that fast 10 times. And in Athens, Georgia is where we've done our work around common poultry. And if there is deemed a need to be able to conduct further research, uh, we we'll certainly uh, have the capacity to do that. So at this time, there are not, there are not any conversations about that. Um, but rest assured, your intramural research agency has the capacity to do it if it is deemed um, necessary. Well, that's it for now. Okay. Um, <laughs> thank you again so much, Dr. Jacobs Young, for uh, participating and sharing, you know, your vast knowledge of this essential, fantastic research agency at USDA. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Have a good meeting. Thank you. Thank you. And so now I'm going to turn the session over to. Dr. Russ Jessup. So let me go ahead and, and make him a presenter so we can do that. All right, and I'll unmute you. So Russ, whenever you're ready, you can unmute and you can, you can start your presentation. All right, can you hear me, Elizabeth? Yes, I can, perfectly. Beautiful, thank you. I wanted to thank you for the invitation to, to take part in this webinar and your help, particularly with the technology. We had fun with that. Uh, but for me, it's a particular particular privilege to be asked to give this uh, portion of the talk as a university faculty and academic. Uh, and as, doc, as Dr. Jacob Young mentioned, one in three ARS centers is co-located. So the, the, the biggest impact I, I'd like to advocate for with ARS is simply that their reach, uh, their impact on us is immense, uh, it's exponential. I guess if I sit here in, in A&M, I work on perennial grasses, that spans forage, turf grass, biofuels, uh, newer topics, and even more recently, industrial hemp. Uh, but if you look at this first slide I have in there, it's a tenfold reach, and that simply means that I have directly benefited from collaborators within my research from 11, centers across the southeastern and central states uh, and this spans everything from writing grants that are awarded or not this spans sharing germplasm this spans research, research trials uh, scale research all manner of, of of efforts that we can work with on and i would contend that if you asked any plant breeder plant scientist uh, research level academic They're going to give you the same response. They're going to say that they work with and benefit from uh, from many ARS centers and many ARS collaborators. So the, the value to us as academics uh, is significant. And as, as Dr. Jacob Young mentioned, that they have their priority areas within ARS, and we see that linkage with us coming across within food security, and nutrition, all manner of ecosystem services, whether it's labeled climate hubs or climate change or other. Uh, so, and in reality, that may not be as well as that it is. And I think the bottom part of this slide really hits upon the next advantage or benefit I receive from ARS 
it gives us an opportunity to make progress in our research that we cannot attain uh, via other sources. So a lot of times we want to we want to engage upon a particular project and we don't have preliminary data. It, it is considered too high of risk, so we don't get federal grants. Uh, we can't find the system and private industry sees no immediate profit or they see it not enough long-term revenue potential. Uh, and in reality, the business model in the current current uh, atmosphere in the state level is that we are very often redirected to seek federal funding. So there are a lot of opportunities we would like to seek, but we cannot. And some of the time we can pursue that with ARS collaborators. So it helps us fill research gaps that help drive our programs and draw. And to just give a few examples from my program, these are three benefited the most from with ARIS scientists, carbon sequestration, some novel hybrids, uh, and some renewable bio-based products. And focus on three of some of my program, but I would say any, any research scientist could give you the same types of examples, the same numbers of examples, where they And like many, we're focuses on having to reduce carbon in our atmosphere, trying to do that with land-based uh, methods or agricultural based methods has been pursued, whether it's forestation, conservation tillage, cover crops. We've looked more at direct storage of carbon below ground in roots, rhizomes, and soil organic carbon. And the example out here is a crop, sorghum. It's the third most important grain crop in the U.S., fifth in the world. And it has had a long effort and my predecessor trying to quantify and characterize this crop for its perennialy, its sustainability, and more recently, its ability to sequester carbon below ground. And I highlighted five research scientists with ARS that have worked on this crop. The first, Dr. Schurz, he made the first crosses between this and an annual sorghum. This was the base of the first sequencing. You know, this is Elizabeth. It sounds like Russ was having some connectivity issues. And um, Russ, are you there? Well, perhaps um, I can make, if, if Russ, if, unless you come back, um, I could try making Alice the presenter. Maybe uh, Dr. Lichtenstein can give her presentation. Uh, while we wait for your connectivity to come back. And then you can take pick up where you left off with respect to sorghum. Um, Dr. Lichtenstein, would you, are you ready to give your presentation? Absolutely. Can you hear me? Thank you. Yes, I can. I'm going to make you a presenter. So okay, that you can and share. then just confirm that you're seeing the right view of the, um, of the slides. Uh, no, I can see your note slides. There it okay, is. Now. Perfect. Okay. okay. All right. Well, um, I too really appreciate the opportunity to introduce you to the Jean Mayer USDA Human Nutrition Research Center on Aging at Tufts University. Um, the center came to being in 1997 when Congress directed establishment of a human nutrition research facility at Tufts University in Massachusetts. And we have in the building both uh, ARS scientists and then people like me who are academic researchers who are also who are team leaders of various research groups within the HNRCA. Um, as part of the Agricultural Research Service, we are one of eight human nutrition research programs, each with its own unique mission. And our mission is to promote healthy aging through nutrition science to empower people seeking to enjoy long, active, and independent lives. So this is the point that hopefully we will all get to, to be older Americans. And I should also note that this is a demographic in the United States that is rapidly expanding. 
Now, there's a broad range of research that is going on at the HNRCA at the cellular level in vitro um, using animal models, human intervention studies, and then epidemiological that um, work with large cohorts. Our aging research focuses on the areas of bone and muscle, cardiovascular health, cancer, cognition, dietary patterns, inflammation, vision, and obesity, diabetes, and metabolism, which along with cardiovascular health encompasses cardiometabolic health. There are 13 research teams in the building, and I must say it's a unique opportunity to work in an environment where the entire building is focused on nutrition. It's something that's quite rare. And um, although we are organized into 13 research teams, there's just a tremendous amount of collaboration that goes on among those teams. In addition, we're fortunate that we're supported um, by six scientific core units. So for example, we have a metabolic research unit where we do our human intervention studies. We have a centralized nutrition evaluation laboratory, which all the teams use. We have an animal core facility, computer science support, and a statistical analysis team that we can work with when we start designing our studies straight through data analysis. Now, the driving forces for us as researchers at the HNRCA, we've summarized them into the three Ds, discover, develop, and deliver. Now, in terms of discover, um, our aim is to identify cutting edge pathways and mechanisms that can be translated to increasing our lifespan. So we're really going from the bench to the table to optimal health. Um, and to, to introduce you or to illustrate some of the things that have going on and have gone on that I think are a real contribution to the ARS and to um, the US nutrition policy, I'm going to give you some examples. So some of them include collaboration with the US Army to develop a method to sustain uh, weight loss, which is critical both for veterans and for their dependents. Um, we've elucidated the dangers of trans fat leading to mandatory inclusion on the nutrient facts panel and removal of partially hydrogenated fat from the FDA grass list. So that's something that impacts on all Americans. Um, we're I, involved in the identification of key phytonutrients in plant foods that slow the age associated disorders such as hardening of the arteries and hypertension. Um, we're involved in the development of a better understanding of muscle and bone function, particularly in older adults that are at very high risk for falls. And once there is a fall in terms of healthcare expenditure and quality of life can be quite diminished. Um, we're involved in the creation of new nutritional solutions to prevent some of the major causes of disability in older adults, including blindness, hip fracture, muscle loss, cancer, and impaired cognition. We make contributions to a critical tool for evaluating diet quality in the United States, and that's the US Food Composition Database, which is available to all. Um, we are currently focusing on emerging areas in the field, such as gut microbiome and development of genome-based personalized diets. And we're involved in the advancement of understanding of nutrient requirements for older adults. At one point, about 30, 40 years ago, we considered older adults to be anyone 80 plus, excuse me, 50 plus. Then we got more to uh, 65 plus, and now we're realizing that there's a large segment of the older adults that are in the older age groups, and that it's really important to understand whether dietary requirements need to be modified or not. In terms of develop, we're involved in developing essentially the next generation of nutrition researchers who are going to drive innovation. It's very critical that um, we think about the future. So we have master's students, PhD students, postdocs involved in experiential learning and providing an environment for them to actually develop to be independent researchers, which really we are going to be driving the future and we're going to be dependent on 
for um, pushing the frontier forward as far as nutrition science goes in all areas. Now, in terms of delivery, we are extending our research to the community. So it's not only what goes on in our building or goes on in our building and in the building of those we collaborate with in the terms of scientists, but really how we can um, transfer this research to the broader, um, the broader population. Um, so some examples of that is HNRCA scientists serves on, serve on committees and panels that establish dietary guidance, U.S. dietary guidance. So that would be um, serving on dietary guidance advisory committee. That's the committee that's convened every five years that writes a scientific report that's then presented to federal agencies who actually establish the dietary guidelines for Americans, which is critical because all feeding programs, things like the military, Meals on Wheels, um, adhere to those guidelines. Um, we serve on panels for the National Academy of Medicine that are revising the dietary reference intakes, and that's where we are now seeing the need to put more emphasis on the requirements for older adults. And we serve on numerous nutrition committees of health advocacy organizations, such as the American Heart Association, that also um, develop nutrition policy. In addition, we have a lot of alliances and collaborations, certainly with the USDA and ARS, and a, a number of us have collaborations with other um, scientists at other human nutrition research centers. Um, within the Tufts community, we have alliances with the Tufts Clinical and Translational Science Institute, this, our CTSI. We currently have the Nourish program going. That's um, nutrition intervention research, where we're trying to identify the characteristics of human nutrition intervention studies that are the ones that specifically contribute to the development and updating of nutrition guidance. Um, we are involved with a lot of research networks, such as the Boston Claude Pepper Older Adults Independence Center, the Boston Nutrition Obesity Research Center, BNORC, the Comprehensive Assessment of Long-Term Effect of Reducing Intake of Energy Network, the Calorie Working Group, and the cohorts for the um, Heart and Aging Research in Genomic Epidemiology, or the CHARGE Consortium. And all these provide opportunities to expand the uh, type and um, complexity of the research that we do. We also partner with a lot of groups to make this happen. And um, one example of that is a particular alliance that uh, is close to my heart, and that's with AARP, where we actually developed MyPlate for older adults. So we took the template of MyPlate that is, was developed by USDA, and we've customized it specifically for older adults. And um, we do this by putting more emphasis on specific food choices, because we know as we age, our energy requirements, calorie requirements go down, but our nutrient needs either stay the same or go up. So it means each choice within each food group becomes very important. We know that as we age in some individuals, there's somewhat of a disassociation between our state of hydration and our urge to consume fluids. And this is particularly important for older adults when we get older. So we have a, a segment for fluids and then also reinforcing the importance of regular physical activity. So what I am going to do now is shift the microphones and in closing, illustrate with a short video how we actually um, translate this for the public. So if you bear with me for a minute. Okay. Nutrition needs change as we age. We may become less active, our metabolism slows, and our ability to absorb some nutrients becomes less efficient. This means that the food we choose to eat and the amount of nutrients in those foods become even more important. Use my plate for older adults as a tool to help you when you shop, decide on types and combinations of foods you cook. So the 
foods you choose to eat should be rich in vitamins and minerals. My Plate for Older Adults was created in the framework of the 2015 to 2020 Dietary Guidelines for Americans from the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services and the U.S. Department of Agriculture. The plate is divided into five sections. Fruits and vegetables, grains, dairy, protein, healthy oils, and separate sections for herbs and spices and foods. Okay. Whoops. Okay, hopefully you could see that and that's only part of the um, the video, but it's a way of really translating it to the general public. So um, with that, I thank you for your attention and I really appreciate the opportunity to highlight what goes on at the Jean Mayer USDA Human Nutrition Research Center on Aging at Tufts University. Thank you. Thanks so much, Dr. Lichtenstein. That was a, a great illustration of how ARS partners with universities and how those partnerships spawn other partnerships. Um, that was really terrific. Thank you so much. And I heard from Russ that his, his internet is, is back. So I'm going to go ahead and um, make him a presenter again so we can try to get uh, the rest of his the rest of his um, presentation. There we go. And Russ, just so you know, you're still muted. There you go. Is that better, Elizabeth? Yes, thank you. I can hear you now. All right. Like you were saying about sorghum. I apologize for being lost in the ether somehow, but I was just trying to get through a few examples of how ARS has benefited my program. And the first one was perennial sorghum. And really that translates the work of several scientists. And where it's allowed me to progress is to identify sorghums that still produce a lot of biomass above ground, but can produce uh, over 20 tons of biomass below ground. So the picture in the lower right of this slide demonstrates that. And it's just an example of what could be done if we redesigned the, the look of some of our modern crops. We could be sequestering immense amounts of carbon below ground uh, in very short time frames. And if you think about it across all grazing lands and all ag lands across the entire planet, you could negate the entire six decades of atmospheric carbon. That's somewhat of a, a lofty aspiration. If you simply launch it across the major cereal crops, nothing else, you could reduce our net emissions on an annual basis to zero just by putting this type of a below ground rooting structure onto our annual uh, cereal crops. So it has a huge uh, potential for carbon sequestration. And we're starting to make progress on putting it onto the grain as well. So rhizomes, biomass, leaf matter for forage and grains. So I think it's a, a great way for us to advance the crop and the data uh, in large part with the help of the ARS collaborators. The second example I wanted to include was the use of trying to make a novel crop, a triploid that's identical or synonymous to your seedless watermelons, bananas, and other crops that we enjoy. We can do the same thing with forage crops. And this was started decades ago by ARS scientists and continued by two successors at, in Georgia, and they have developed the crop, they demonstrated the hybrid, they have maintained and curated at the germplasm system, the ARS manages uh, both parental species, and I was able to build upon their progress. And we have advanced the crop, we have made inbreds of one of the parents, we've made uh, more biomass types of the other type of parents, so we've, we've, we've gone a little further than they had. and. We collaborated with another ARS scientist here in the College Station location, specifically to improve the fertility and the seed production of this crop to get over some of the final hurdles uh, to make it a commercially viable crop. We believe we are there. And as one of the outputs of that, we finally have an agreement to commercialize this crop. And the green box in this to me is, is a key point for any plant breeder. Every plant breeder that I'm aware of at a, at a public institution collaborates with ARS scientists and those collaborations help directly with cultivar development, cultivar release, and commercialization. So the impact of ARS is collaboration for research, but also for the development of real-world 
uh, plant materials that are out there in a commercial sense. The third example is something that's been, I mentioned, you know, projects that were higher risk, needing preliminary data, and trying to view our crops as, as biorefineries, standing, standing fodder in the field of platform molecules. We've been able to do this for several different types of bio-based products, again, working with the perennial sorghums and the perennial pearl millets, and working with the scientists here at the ARS Center and College Station, trying to make uh, biorefineries a uh, leg legitimate, logistical, economically feasible system in the U.S. And it builds upon our work, of course, turning some of the sugars, standing cellulose emicillus into ethanol. It's also been using some of the residues that are not used for that uh, to turn them into silica. Some of these crops have three to seven percent silica, and of course, that can be used for car tires, shoe, shoe rubber, anything from photovoltaics. So it depends on how much you upgrade it. Uh, but these plants could be platforms for biosilica and remove the need for the uh, mining from soils. We've also looked at them as producing precursors for plastics. These plants converting sunlight into sugars, they, they make four carbon molecules. Those molecules can be used directly to make plastics. And we've got some preliminary data on that as well, working with aero scientists. We've also looked at these crops for their production of proteins, right? Everyone's a, a, aware of using leaf protein and whey protein. We have grasses that can produce five to 10 times the protein per input of water and nutrient of what's out on the market now. So there is huge opportunity uh, for leaf protein concentrates from plant biorefineries or biomass. And I guess the last slide I had was we've also tried to use these grasses to modify them to replace things that are not sustainable. We've turned them into uh, replacements for peat moss and we're starting to try to reuse them as replacements for inorganic uh, fertilizers. And all of these examples have involved aerosol scientists again and I guess the last thought I wanted to, to lead, uh, Elizabeth kind of mentioned we wanted to show the value ARS has given us, but also what we think might be needed in the future. And you can see here, again, I've got ARS's size. I've got their current reach, you know, spanning us, industry NGOs, all the producers uh, at the different levels. And again, the future need, this to me, is not a time where we need to be uh, downsizing ARS. It, it should be growing. And again, they mentioned in the previous talk with uh, – uh, Dr. Jacob Young, states that don't currently have ARS centers, and again, all the other global societal issues that are listed there that, that renew uh, the need for increased agriculture intensification and sustainability. Okay, and with that, I'll stop. Thank you, Elizabeth. Great, thank you so much. And I'm going to turn my camera back on so that I can um, just say hello to everybody again. I've just got a few more questions, but if, if anyone has additional questions, they can put them into the question box and then I'll ask our presenters. Um, so the first one actually came right at the tail end of Dr. Jacobs Young's, um, Jacobs Young's presentation. And I'm gonna ask uh, you both, but as a matter of fact, um, I think Gary Mayo is on the line. And Gary um, works with Dr. Jacobs Young at ARS, so I might actually call on him also to help with this question. So the question is, what is the level of coordination um, between ARS and other federal labs, like EPA labs, working on similar issues? Um, now, it sounded like Dr. Lichtenstein partnered with the U.S. Army, for example, um, but are there, are there others? So um, I'm going to go ahead and, let's see, if Gary's there, I'm going to request to unmute you. If you're there, you can, you can maybe, maybe you could answer that question. I am. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. So yes, we we do work with other agencies and other departments, like the Department of Energy, for some of our urban ag uh, that we may go into. As you mentioned, uh, the U.S. Army and uh, working with them down in Florida. Um, so yes, we, we do work with other agencies and other departments, um, and uh, I'll leave that uh, for Tufts as well, because I know they were working with other agencies as well. Terrific. Thank you so much. Yeah, I, I used to work at USDA, remember, really neat collaborations with NASA on remote sensing, and there yes. are terrific, terrific examples of working with other federal agencies as well. Um, Absolutely. And, yeah. Okay. okay. And then, 
Yes. I could comment on that. Well, so first of all, I want to make it clear those accomplishments were not just for my lab. That was for the whole HNRCA. So in terms of working with the Army. But um, I think we are able to collaborate with whomever. So if it's an ARS lab as Beltsville, we had two very productive collaborations with them. We can do it. Or if it's, you know, out, outside with but with AFRI grants, things like that. So I want to be respectful of everyone's time. We're, you know, we're coming up on the hour, amazingly enough. Um, so I'm just going to ask, I think, one, maybe two more questions. Uh, this one's for, for Russ, but I think I think Alice could also chime in here if you want. Um, what is different about working with ARS scientists as opposed to collaborating with scientists at other universities? And I, I'm going to jump in and say it sounded like the type of project is different. Um, you can do more preliminary stuff that you can't get a NIFA grant for um, because it's too pie in the sky, too risky. You don't you need that preliminary data. Um, but is there is there anything else beyond that that you know we might want to know? Absolutely. I would say that if, if I'm collaborating with someone else at another state university, we're on a, a one, two or three year timeline for the research. It's based on the granting cycles. If we're working with ARS, we can base this on plant breeding cycles, which can run five, seven or 10 years. So it allows us to have a, an ongoing legitimate program and not, not do the starts and stops you have with granting cycles. Um, for That's right, so us, longer term. For us, it's a matter that we need to go through a process to get approval, ARS approval, in order to um, do some of that research. But I think that's really to make certain that we all stay on our own mission. And I think it helps us focus our work more so that we can actually accomplish what we are essentially were created to do, which is to focus on older Americans. Right, well, so thank you to everyone who attended um, today, this webinar, and thank you so much to our panelists. Russ, Alice, you're fantastic. Um, I, I, I would just like to take a moment uh, and, and thank everyone for attending and to remind you that our last briefing in the series on the Economic Research Service and the National Ag Statistics Service will be held on Tuesday, April 6th at 1 p.m. Um, and with that, again, thank you so much for attending and uh, we'll see you next time. Bye-bye.